I don't think anybody's actually on Zoom, so hopefully this records the sound. All right, so we're going to do cardiovascular um, diseases. So this is chapter 48 in Darby and Walsh. And um, these are the objectives here, um, identifying the different cardiovascular diseases and risk factors. Talk, we'll talk briefly about etiology, risk factors, signs and symptoms, and um, but a lot of this stuff you've had already, so I don't like to go in depth because I just feel like it gets really, it's nice to review, but I feel like it gets kind of uh, repetitive or just too much. It really just bogs down this class, to be honest, because there is so much to go over. Um, evaluate relationship between cardiovascular disease and periodontal disease. Uh, I noticed when I was reviewing this that that really it's almost missing a little bit from this PowerPoint, to be honest. And so I'm like, oh, I need to actually bump that up a little bit. Um, so I don't feel like that objective is actually quite met yet. So um, I probably will actually um, go into that this week and um, fix it. Just add maybe just one slide, a just a little bit. There's not a ton of information. It's just something that they're constantly studying, this correlation or this connection between people with cardiovascular disease and the rate of periodontal disease um, and vice versa. So it's just sort of something that's being studied. And then discuss dental hygiene care and appointment guidelines. Um, just one slide, very, very brief overview on types of surgery. That's not something that you're going to get necessarily. Oh, I shouldn't say that maybe with, with such confidence, but I don't believe there's any exam questions on it. It's just more informational. And then oral manifestations, of course, is the, always a big one. Uh, appointment guidelines, appointment alterations, and then um, oral manifestations. Those are always things that I feel like should be the kind of the things we hit harder. Um, so the types of cardiovascular disease, we have hypertension, which you guys are all probably fairly familiar with that since you have so many patients, coronary heart disease, dysrhythmias and arrhythmias, and we'll talk about the similarity and differences a little bit there, congestive heart failure, congenital heart diseases, valvular heart defects. Um, and with that, we'll talk kind of connected to that a little bit as the rheumatic heart disease and then infective endocarditis. So um, I was gonna set myself a timer here. It's so we go until 3.20, right? Okay, so I'm gonna just talk for 20 minutes and then I'm, we'll take a break. I know you've already been, no, not an hour. Okay. So with cardiovascular disease, um, in general, it's an alteration of something is going on in the heart. Something's not working right. Some part of the heart is not doing what it's supposed to do or the function is impaired. Um, and it's a leading cause of death, about 45% of the death worldwide last I checked this year. The numbers on a lot of diseases have gotten kind of wonky with COVID, but this was probably updated that probably right before COVID. Um, management of risk factors is really important to talk to your patient about what they're doing, um, if they're aware of their things that make them at greater risk or things that they can change. Um, and then congestive um, or cardiovascular disease and periodontal disease, they share a couple risk factors. Um, so that gives us that perfect kind of wedge into the conversation about their oral health and their physical health together. So, Diabetes and cardiovascular disease are nice because we have that perfect sort of wedge into that conversation where we can talk to them about it. So diabetes, smoking, age, and poor socioeconomic conditions tend to be the shared um, risk factors. And then the chronic infection from periodontal disease um, may increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. And that's sort of one of the topics that's sort of being studied. Um, they're, they're not saying one causes it, they're saying that they've observed a correlation. So risk factors, things that are, you can't change, non-modifiable, things that um, are fixed, your genes, your age, your race, your gender, 
um, things that are changeable, our lifestyle, um, anything that has to do with your lifestyle, of course. Um, and then um, periodontal disease, you know, trying to improve your oral health. And then personality traits, that kind of type A, you know, workaholic, stressed out kind of person that's always just like running constantly, doesn't ever give themselves a break. They tend to also be at a higher risk. And then there's some things with disease patterns like history of eating disorder or uh, past use of certain medications um, like Fenfen. So that those could also potentially increase somebody's risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, here's just the chart that you guys have probably seen numerous times for the blood pressure categories. Um, Hypertension is not really considered a specific disease, but more a physical finding or a symptom that uh, potentially you know, just sort of raises that red flag that it puts you at higher risk for other conditions or potentially something else. Sometimes they say, we know why you have high blood pressure. It's because of this other condition. But a lot of times they say, well, we don't know why you have high blood pressure. You just seem to be having it. Of course, age is another thing too. Just as people age, they tend to um, have um, more incidence of high blood pressure. So one thing that I thought was important to remind you just in case I'm sure you've heard this in other classes is individuals with where's my note of what I wanted to say do, do, do. oh okay so individuals with systolic or diastolic uh, high blood pressure readings in in different categories so say it's normal in one and high in the other um they, you always designate them to the higher. So it's kind of like that, what's the worst area of perio in your mouth? That's your category, that's your stage. It's the same thing with, um, with blood pressure. I'm sure you guys have already heard that, but just as a reminder. So what do we do with our patients with cardiovascular? We don't, um, or high blood pressure, we don't do a ton unless it's uncontrolled, super high blood pressure. Of course, we always screen our patients, we always monitor our patients, and then we help them to understand. And um, so, you know, it's the patient that you see that comes in every time and they're just screaming high blood pressure and you're, you say, this is really high, are you always this high? And they're like, oh, it's just because I'm here. And they just want to poo-poo it and minimize it. So, you, you know, it's like with anything, you don't want to beat them over the head with, you know, you're making bad choices, but you just can be that, kind of gentle reminder of, of the reasons why it's dangerous and you know, how it affects other parts of your body and all your organs are under higher stress, um, especially organs that have smaller vascular, you know, systems that support them. And so just that, you know, having that information to share with them on a regular basis um, and monitoring, they, they might never get that information anywhere else besides the, besides the dentist. So um, with our drug therapy, um, just to review, we do the diuretics. They promote that uh, taking out the excess fluid from, from the blood so that to, to in that way, try to help to relieve the blood pressure. So reduce um, renal excretion of water and sodium ions, such as hydrochlorothiazide, um, sympatholytic agents. Um, they modify the um, sympathetic nervous system. So like your beta blockers, um, lisinopril is an example of um, a sympatholytic. And then your vasodilators, um, just to expand the blood vessel, um, they just increase the size. And your minoxidil is an example of that. That also happens to be Rogaine, funny little side effect of minoxidil, it grows hair. And then, um, so then just to remind you of the categories, you have the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers, I was trying to find like its perfect category. It, it is a vasodilator, but I feel like it's also a, sym a sympatholytic agent. Does anybody feel like they have a hard answer on that? I was like, where do you fit calcium channel blockers? So I'm not, I should know that, but for some reason, I don't, but it does, it does um, dilate the blood vessels. So that I know. Um, diuretics, ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Hypertensive, um, so dental hygiene care and appointment guidelines. So just, we know that a lot of those medications from oral um, med, remember a lot of them can cause orthostatic hypotension. So we just want, if we know our patient's on a 
high blood pressure med, we want to um, raise them up slowly. Um, they may have an increased need to urinate. Diuretic or not, xerostomia and gingival enlargement if we're taking a pine or a calcium channel blocker. Um, there are some other things at the end of this slide deck. There's a list of some of the most common medications. And I noticed that they put in some things like ulceration, like or um, just ulcerations in the mouth and stuff that the oral med book didn't comment on. So there, you know, that's the thing you get when you get two different or multiple textbooks, everyone's kind of will find a little bit of different stuff. So there probably are a few other oral manifestations besides this. Oh yeah, like we have the lichenoid reaction. Some of them can cause, I remember that from one of the drugs. I can't remember which one it is now, but anyways, um, I think it's high blood pressure med. So if your patient is uncontrolled high blood pressure, you're gonna postpone treatment. In general, if they're controlled but high, you kind of want to keep them on this shorter, reduce your anxiety um, kind of regimen that you're going to do with many patients. I mean, the name of the game for many of our um, chronic, like pretty serious chronic conditions is keep the appointment short, keep your patient happy. I mean, you can summarize it into those two things. It kind of repeats itself over and over again. Um, altered um, local anesthetic administration, for the most part, epi is, is okay. We here in our clinic, we, we're going to be very cautious about things. You'll learn things in, that you've learned over the summer um, that are pretty stringent because, you know, we will always take the very conservative road for anything we do because we're learning uh, a school. But out in the real world, epi is generally used unless the patient has very high, um, uh, specifically they say something about epi or they're out uncontrolled and then even with most heart conditions, there's a two minimum, um, always using a little bit of caution. Um, and then you can also use um, a more diluted, like one to 200,000. And then of course you can give four carpools um, if, if that, uh, per, that ratio is, is diluted a little bit, but in general. And if, but if you're never, if you're not sure, you just don't know about your patient and your concern, you obviously will always go to your doctor and the physician, you can talk to the, uh, position. Anybody have anything to add to that about from like a, uh, pain management, anything that you think maybe differs from what I said here? I always like being reminded. No? Nope. Oh, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Let me show you. So um, for the Pacific Cutoff. So your cutoff is 160 over 100, but hypertensive crisis from my resource is 180 to 120. If your patient's in that range, did did you see something different somewhere, or does our? Yeah. Yeah. No. Good. Yeah. That's that's what um, I think. This is. I don't know. I think this is from our our manual, but I'm pretty sure that our textbook says something similar. So yeah, hypertensive crisis would be um, 180 over 120. So if you have a patient in one of these two ranges, you're going to, we're going to refer them even in a, even in private practice. This is, I, I've had several patients over the years that have been like, you're like, my gosh, this is, I'm pretty sure you're like hypertensive crisis. Like you don't say it to them and you don't freak out, but this is what you're thinking. And they're just sitting there like, I know my blood pressure is high. And you're just like, why are you sitting there not like broking out on the floor or something? So people can have elevated, very elevated blood pressure and not necessarily feel bad. I mean, their body is not happy. Things are not going well, but it's not like they're necessarily, um, you know, in a true crisis where like you have to call EMS or something. But in our, if we do find this, then we do immediately refer to medical provider or medical clearance. Um, they need a medical clearance to come back. We, they need to prove that they, and this happens in private practice too. Like if a patient has blood pressure this high, a doctor won't, uh, won't see them until they show that they've um, controlled it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody else, my guess is in the 
you have to walk them, right? Yeah. 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 all your facts it's like come on yeah our cutoff at Natsuda's office our cutoff was 180 over 100 and so actually closer to is ours was like almost half of you know half and half um so and that's interesting to know that kaiser is 200 many private practices like we like that's just another example of how we're just more conservative because we're it's a learning but that's interesting yeah that's in, yeah it's interesting um how it's it is different in private practice a little bit anyways um okay so but when you do you obviously you guys know from experience at this point you can just take the vitals let your patient relax feet flat on the floor sitting upright don't have you know they shouldn't be talking and too um, animated maybe drink a little water and then take their vitals again hopefully their blood pressure will have gone down um coronary heart disease is the next one that we will talk about. So what is it? So it's insufficient blood flow from the coronary arteries into the heart or the myocardium, the muscle of the heart. And the main, um, the main disorders that are associated uh, with coronary heart disease are atherosclerotic um, heart disease. I don't know if you guys ever noticed, but there's different names. There's like, um, arterial sclerosis and then atherosclerosis and i'm pretty sure they're the same thing right it's just sometimes i change the name because i'm like is it arterial is it atro so if you notice it jumping around from time to time i just read different resources and then i second guess myself what should be in there but i think they're all the same it's just um, that plaque build up in the in the arteries angina pectoris coronary insufficiency and um, my um cardio infarction or a heart attack so the major cause of coronary heart disease is atherosclerosis. And of course, that's the buildup of that um, fat, the plaque, the fatty plaque, or that um, the fibro fatty substance, which is what we call the plaque buildup, narrowing the lumen in the arteries and either just constricting it down so that um, the blood flow just gets less and less or um, the, you know, the really bad consequence that we don't want to have happen is a piece of that plaque breaks off and causes an obstruction. Yeah, Avalon. Atherosclerosis is a pattern of arterial disease. Yeah. 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 I knew somebody would find this for me. So it's a pattern of arterial yeah. obstruction? Yeah. Atherosclerosis is a pattern of arterial obstruction. It's basically just like the thickening of the wall. Yeah. Oh, so very good. So then this main, this first heading here, let me get my cursor. This one should probably say arterial. That's what it said actually a couple days ago. And then I changed it. So this should say arterial sclerosis. And then a major cause then would be after. Very good, thank you, Avalon. Okay, um, narrowing of the lumen is caused by the fibro fatty deposits containing lipids and cholesterol, and then the deposits thicken with time and it can occlude or piece can break off. We don't want that to happen. I actually heard a cardiologist talking about this and they said that um, people can go a very 
long time with the narrow the lumen narrowing and narrowing because it's a slow it's a slow like squeezing off and your body everything adjusts so everything kind of gets used to this subpar not so optimal condition but it's when there's these more like kind of roughened areas or pieces that break off it's like that and it does form differently so I, I suppose it could be from different ways that the atherosclerosis manifests itself but they're saying that that kind of narrowing of the lumen gives your body a chance to kind of acclimate whereas other kinds of buildup that are maybe more jagged or something and the pieces can break off that's the far more dangerous kind because that's when you get those the blockage interestingly enough angina pectoris so what is that that is inadequate oxygen um, um needed blood flow to the heart and it causes that uh, chest pain so for a patient with um angina pectoris the goal is to really just reduce the demand of the myocardium. So, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, they'll get it if they have to exert themselves, walk up the stairs, you know, things like that. And it, not necessarily as much if they're just sitting still in a chair, but if they have stress, if they're feeling anxious. Um, so um, I'll very oftentimes patients who have angina, they of course know about their condition. Very oftentimes it's stable. They'll have their nitroglycerin um, with them that they use, um, which is a vasodilator. Um, so for patients with angina, if they are in your chair, of course, the main thing is to find out how often you want to talk to them about their condition. How often do you have um, attacks, if that's the right word? How often do you have these episodes? When was your last one? Did it go away easily when you took your nitrous? Or did you have to take like two or, um, you know, so you kind of talk to them a little bit. Um, what makes it worse? What makes it better? So you just kind of want to know just so you're not surprised by anything. You don't want any surprises while you're sitting there cleaning their teeth. Um, you, of course, monitor and record their vital signs. Um, patients who take nitroglycerin need to um, renew their supply quite regularly because it loses its potency. Um, and in a med medical emergency situation, this hopefully this is what um, syncs up with what you guys learned in junior year. But basically, if they are having an attack, you give them their nitro. Five minutes later, if they're still in pain, you give them another one. Five minutes later, if they're still in pain, you give them another one. Five minutes later, they're still in pain, you call EMS. Does that sound familiar and correct? Hallelujah. Okay. So... Um, After the second one, two, not three, you give them three. That's when you call. Okay, sounds good. And I think, I think my little thing's about to go off here. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, let me just get, I think I just have two more slides. Let me just do this real quick, and then we'll get to the next section. Um, so a heart attack. So this is kind of can be a confusing one. So, um, so what is it? So some, um, uh, an individual had an episode where they had no or very reduced um, blood flow. And so they had an infarct, which is basically a part of the heart muscle dies because of lack of blood flow. Um, so that's what a myocardial infarction is. And so if a patient comes in and said, oh, I just had a heart attack last week, then you say, oh, goodness. Okay, well, talk to me about that. Um, obviously you live because you're sitting in my chair, um, but that you want to, them to know, you want them to talk to you about if they're stable and this sort of stuff. So most of the time you're going to postpone treatment for at least 30 days post a uh, heart attack. Um, other sources say three to six months. Um, I know stroke is also, um, there's a, there's a three to six month um, window for stroke. And there's lots of different resources that say different things. Um, but so it, sometimes it is based on what your doctor's comfortable with. Um, sometimes the physician or the cardiologist just straight up tells them you can't do anything until, you know, this much time past um, your heart attack. Because you really want to make sure that they're stable. The drug therapies that they're going to be on is likely anticoagulants. Digitalis um, is the um, one a lot of times patients with congestive heart failure take digitalis or digoxin is the common name that you might see antihypertensive drugs as well. Um, 
So clarify symptoms after, oh, go ahead, Trey. Is it for our clinic, that's a, I should have put in our protocol in this slide deck. Um, that sounds likely to me since we do tend to be conservative. So I'll update this and put that in the slide deck because that's, um, so yeah, clarify symptoms after 30 days following a heart attack. If they're stable and they're on the right meds and they're feeling good, it's no problem. It's just like any other patient with a heart condition. Um, if they're unstable, obviously you're gonna postpone it. They probably likely won't be in your chair if they're unstable. Of course, it's the same conditions and considerations for um, a patient that's had a heart attack in their past, especially their recent past. We wanna keep their appointments short and comfortable. We don't wanna stress them out. We don't want them to be in a lot of pain. Um, adequate pain control, we can always use nitrous um, if there's no other contraindications. And then when the time is appropriate um, and, you know, and we've established all the good um, relationships and they're not stressed out, then that's a good time to talk to them about what, what kind of lifestyle changes have you made now that you, you've had a heart attack? Have there been something that you've implemented? And let me talk to you some more about your oral health. And, yeah. But you introduce those in those appropriate moments. You just don't bombard patients with that. Um, make sure I'm not missing anything on my notes. No, I don't think so. Okay, so we won't do the dysrhythmias and arrhythmias quite yet. We'll just take a five minute break or so because we have, well, we have about an hour. I think we have plenty of time. Let's take a 10 minute break. Oh, okay, yeah, let's take 10 minutes. I got 30 slides left. I'm like, can I do 30 slides in that? I think I can. I can do 30 slides in 15 minutes. So yeah, go ahead and take a 10 minute break. I see it. We can see it in the At this point, if I get done, well, I don't know, we'll see, never mind. Um, okay, so um, the term dysrhythmia and arrhythmia, sometimes doctors will use them interchangeably. But one thing to just note is in general, if somebody has a dysrhythmia, that's typically talking about some kind of a disease process going on in the heart. And if there's an arrhythmia, sometimes that's just um, attributed to like a stress or something. And so if it's just an arrhythmia, oftentimes if the stress factor goes away, um, you know, I, like I was just sitting there earlier during our faculty meeting and my um, heart kind of went like blubberty blurb. And I was like, what was that? And I remembered, and I remembered I, that happened to me all the time when I was pregnant. So anybody who's had kids, um, you, there's like, you're, you can just feel your heart do funny little beady things that are different when you're pregnant or if you're stressed, things like that. So your heart can kind of do like a little flutter or something like that if you're having emotional stress or um, under direct, you know, um, exertion. But typically um, the dysrhythmias are more attributed to somebody who actually has like a disease process happening. Um, so why is that advanced? Um, so dysfunction of the heart rate and rhythm that manifests in heart palpitations, disturbances of the nerve impulse um, formation. So that's why it's actually having that, that um, weird beat rhythm or a skip beat or something because there's an, a disruption 
and the nerve pulse. So again, like I said, the physical, emotional, various heart diseases, drug toxicity, that can also do that, and electrolyte imbalance, that can also do it as well. Um, and so oftentimes if it's a continued, like a chronic problem that something needs to actually be changed or medication, then um, you can have the electrocardiogram, the EKG or the ECG um, down at the hospital or a doctor's office. And then there's also something called the Holter monitoring system, which is something that somebody actually wears for 24 hours or however long it is at an outpatient. So the doctor can see what goes. Because sometimes if you just sit there with a EKG on for you know five, 10 minutes, they might miss something that they could see in like 24 hours. This, um, these are um, just some various types of um, variations in the heart. The most, probably the most um, important one to really be aware of is this ventricular fibrillation because that is really the most dangerous. That's when your heart is not really pumping, it's just jiggling. So it's just kind of like, it's just like a little jellyfish that you just kind of nudge, but it's not, it's not actually pumping blood, so it's, it's moving. And that's when they'll use the um, shock, you know, to shock it back into, into some kind of a rhythm. So atrial fibrillation is irregular, but at least there's a rhythm there. So they, you know, they don't love atrial fibrillation, but ventricular fibrillation is just, there's no rhythm there at all. Um, and so uh, then there's also bradycardia, um, decreased um, heart rate, tachycardia increased. So just being familiar with those terms are good. Um, and then, so Brady, tachy, or atrial, and ventricle are probably the most important terms to know there. Um, premature ventricular contractions causes an otherwise normal heart rhythm and resting phase when um, contractions drive skipping a beat. That's, maybe that's what I felt during the faculty meeting was a premature ventricular contraction. I have no idea. Um, probably not. And then heart block inter... No, I wasn't even stressed out. I was just sitting there listening. All of a sudden, I was like, Boo -boo. I'm like, well, that was weird. <laughs> It was strange. It, it feels like, doesn't it? Has anyone felt it before? It's like bubbles in your chest or something. I don't know. It's just weird. Um, heart block interference of electrical impulses controlling the heart muscle. So that's um, also rather serious. Um, so with the heart, oh, I have other notes here on the heart block. So heart block is a dysrhythmia caused by the blocking of, um, sorry, I got to move my picture here. Um, blocking of impulses from the atria to the ventricles um, at the AV node. This is all stuff that you do not have to worry about knowing specifics. It's just more informational. It's an interference with the electrical impulses controlling the heart muscle. And there's multiple forms of it. I think that's why I took this out because it's, it's not, we're not going to test you on it, but patients may be, um, uh, they might take things like digitalis or they might take these certain medications for this condition. So the first degree of a heart block dysrhythmia is um, present in coronary artery disease. So digitalis drug therapy um, could potentially be used. And then there's a second degree, impulses are fully blocked in an irregular pattern. And then there's a third degree um, blocking of impulses resulting in atrial and ventricular dissociation. Um, so it's, that is probably way more information. I think that's why I stopped kind of highlighting it. It's at the bottom there. Um, just knowing that sometimes people that have this heart block dysrhythmia, they might be on something like digitalis. But I think other um, dysrhythmias would warrant that kind of medication as well. So patients with a pace, pacemaker, so what is it? So it's an um, inner cardiac device. So it's an implant to help keep the heart on the right rhythm that you know they, you want the patient on. Um, it's a stimulator used to send electrical currents to the myocardium to maintain that heart rate, that um, controlled heart rate. And then back in the day, they used to do unshielded. It's really not done anymore as far as I'm aware. It's mostly all are shielded. However, it's but it's possible that there could be an elderly person in the clinic that comes in with an unshielded. So the one thing that we kind of have to think about is, you know, in a, um, and not so much anymore because of COVID, we don't use so many ultrasonics, but, you know, two years ago, literally 16 people could be using ultrasonics at the same time. Not very likely because you guys know how some people are doing assessments and some people are doing the actual um, active care, but 
but theoretically it could happen, right? And if their pacemaker is unshielded, all that electrical magnetic um, waves could theoretically affect their pacemaker. Um, so you would want to know if, if your patient has a shielded or unshielded. And just the fact, I want. I just, I've never really like seen the difference between a shielded and unshielded pacemaker. Is it, it's still underneath the skin. Oh yeah, it's still underneath the skin. It's okay. the way that they, it's, the, it's a manufacturer okay. thing. And I think it's just something that, something that they changed at some point. So okay. we wouldn't really know the difference. The patient okay. would though, very likely would. Okay. So it's something that you um, would ask. And if for some reason the patient's like, oh, I don't know, then you could call the cardiologist. But chances are you, most patients are gonna have a shield and pacemaker. I think it's like a newer way and a better way that they make their pacemakers nowadays. Um, but yeah, so, one thing you could do is you could lay a lead, lead apron over your patient and that would shield it. Um, so that's an option. Um, and then just being um, cognizant of how many ultrasonics are running or if you have to use the ultrasonic. So it's something to think about. It's, it's not something that's likely to cause a disruption in your care plan, but it's just something to be aware of with patients with a pacemaker. Um, if their pacemaker is starting to not work right, they're gonna have um, issues. They'll, they'll have the same symptoms that they feel if they were experiencing some kind of a dysrhythmia um, before they had the pacemaker and so they're, with their heart rate being irregular. So they might feel difficulty breathing, dizzy, changes in their pulse rate, maybe a chest pain um, if, if things are, are serious or progressing. Turn off electrical interferences. Um, if there is, if they are having a problem, obviously turn off anything that's electrical around them and um, potentially you would ask, you call 911. Um, that kind of goes into the medical emergency. So if somebody has a dysrhythmia or arrhythmia, there's not too much that you're gonna do to change their appointment. You don't need to give them a pre-medication unless there's something more happening with their heart like valves. Um, or um, some of the stuff that we'll just review um, in a few minutes. But just again, considering any medications that they're on and what kind of oral uh, manifestations, you know, the digoxin, um, that's the one. They love asking this on national boards about the medication that can in, um, increase like the gag um, reflex and that's digitalis or digoxin. So if they are anybody, a patient with a pacemaker or a patient with congestive heart failure, if they're on that, that's one of those um, side effects. It kind of increases the gag reflex and nausea because it, it reacts with the GI. It does something in the GI. So it can upset that and increase that whole kind of nausea, vomiting. And that's with digitalis, digoxin. Um, unshielded, less common, but be aware and ask. Manual rather than electrical dental equipment. So you just go to hand scaling monitor and record their vitals and monitor the patient throughout the appointment. You can just um, ask them how they're doing, you know, at a certain point, which we usually do that with most all of our patients. We always like to check in with our patients. Um, congestive heart failure. So um, syndrome characterized by myocardial um, dysfunction that leads to diminished cardiac output. So they're just not the, the heart's just not working efficiently and effectively. So they're just not getting good circulation. They get that fluid um, buildup, um, tachycardia, ventricular dilation, enlargement of the heart muscle. So there's just kind of a, like a flow of, of things that can um, happen. Um, the etiology, so we have that atherosclerosis, hypertensive, um, um, cardiovascular disease, valvular heart disease, pericarditis, circulatory overload, coronary heart disease. So there's just lots of things that can all kind of manifest to, well, you have congestive heart failure. Um, so there's a number of things that can affect it. Medical treatment. Um, there are some lifestyle things that can uh, take place. Um, drug therapy, diuretics, and digitalis are probably the main um, medications. They're gonna have, uh, because there's gonna be sort of a breathing, it's kind of like a twofold thing, you know, like going upstairs, you know, they're gonna be very winded very easily. They may not, oh, I might have it on 
future slides. Hold on, sometimes I jump ahead of myself. Let me see. Yeah, I think I might say it here. Um, they, yeah, may, may need to sit more upright because, so because they, um, because they have this poor sort of poor circulation and the fluid buildup and it affects their lungs, then they're not necessarily going to be as comfortable laying back. So you're going to have to think about maybe keeping them at that mid range point, or they might not be able to lay back for as long. So you have to take those things into consideration. Um, you want to closely monitor um, by the physician. If they're stable and, you know, they, a lot of times you'll get patients and you guys have might have already seen them. They come in and they just don't look well. You just know they're just not like super healthy, but they're still getting around. And so it's just like, you know, you're looking at their meds, you're asking them if they've seen their doctor and has anything major changed. And as long as you're sort of doing your typical dental hygiene care, if you have to give them some local anesthetic, you might consider it a little bit more, obviously. Is this gonna affect anything? How is their blood pressure today? It's just sort of a, a system that you get into because you can see sometimes very sick patients, people that are on dialysis and have congestive heart failure and they have all these things and yet they're in your chair and you've got to treat them. And so as long as their, their stability is or where they're at is normal for them and they're not like in some kind of a crisis or some kind of an uncontrolled state, then you kind of, you just can proceed with caution throughout your, um, the things that you would do for the most part. So consider the causative factors um, two with a patient with congestive heart failure, hypertension, we monitor that. Valvular heart disease, is it present? Do they need premedication? Coronary heart disease and have, are they at a very high risk for having a heart attack anytime soon? Or um, have they had one in the past? You just kind of want to be able to kind of look at that and think about that when you have those types of patients in your chair. Um, again, this is that digitalis or the digoxin, watch for nausea, vomiting, especially when you're taking x-rays or having to do something that's going to go far back. Difficulty breathing, we already talked about that. Minimize stress, nu uh, nutritional calcium, sodium reduction. We might need to consider the air powder polisher if that's something that you happen to use on a regular basis in your practice and you enjoy using it. Um, if you use the sodium bicarbonate one, they might be on a sodium restricted diet. So you have to kind of consider that. Um, I have a few more notes here. Let's see what I, this is something about the left and the right side. Let's see, what was I saying? Patients who have left-sided heart failure have difficulty receiving oxygenated blood from the lungs, resulting in increased fluids and blood in the lungs, causing that dyspnea, that uh, heart um, shortness of breath on lying in a supine position. They might cough more and expatriate more. These patients need, um, very often they might need extra pillows and they don't like that supine position. So this is when their heart failure is more left side of the heart. Right-sided heart failure is associated with the blood return from the body resulting in that systemic venous congestion and peripheral edema. So that's when you see those swollen ankles that's more of the right side. So that's kind of interesting. I forgot about that little point. So patients with right side heart failure have that foot ankle edema and often complain cold hands, cold feet. They just don't have that good circulation. Yeah, Trey. Yes, yes, no problem. So left side of the heart failure, more of a lung shortness of breath. They're not going to want to go back. And they might not know, you know, you might just know this from simply observing, observing them. So left side of the heart, more of a lung thing. They don't want to go back as far. They might cough more. Right side, they're going to have that um, peripheral edema, swollen ankles, um, cold hands, cold feet, swollen feet. That one, it probably wouldn't affect them as much, although it's certainly you want to just be cognizant and ask them, but they might not be bothered by laying back supine as much as somebody that has that shortness of breath. And then you also think about like the water with your ultrasonic and their patients that have that kind of whole breathing, coughing thing are not going to tolerate the water from the ultrasonic as well. So you always have to be a little more aware of that as well. 
Congenital heart disease is the next one here. Abnormality of the heart structure and function, developmental before birth. So um, the individual with um, congenital heart disease does not necessarily require extensive changes when you're um, seeing them as a patient. However, the, Ameri the ADA or AHA, American Heart Association, they do recommend prophylactic antibiotics before dental hygiene procedures to prevent infective endocarditis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in persons with some very specific things. I'm not gonna read this right now because it's actually on a slide later. So there are certain situations where that um, pre-med is, is gonna be warranted. It's, they've reduced it and reduced it and reduced it. So now it's very specific. Um, and some people I had back when they changed it, you know, however, every year it seems like they, they just um, updated it one last time this, I think it was even this, past, this year or maybe last year they updated it. But there, I had patients who had the mitral valve prolapse and they're like, no, I've always taken amoxicillin before I came in and I'm going to still take it just so that just makes me feel better. And I was like, all right, well, you don't need to, but they had been told for so many years to take um, a pre-med because they had a mitral valve prolapse. And so you might get somebody that's older, that is just not, that's so used to it and accustomed to it that they just say, I'm going to do it. But I think that's going to be much fewer and far between as you go along. Um, let's see. Um, okay. So dental hygiene care. So pre-med, um, residual defects following a repair, palliative shunt, first six months after surgery. But I, like I said, I have another slide that goes into this a little bit better. Management of any cardiovascular complication um, resulting from a defect. So pretty much a hard and fast rule is if your patient comes in and they just had something major done and it's been, they're not falling into a category that you feel like automatically ticks that, you know, raises that red flag, never hesitate to call the cardiologist and say, my patient just showed up. They just had the surgery that not long ago. They don't need a pre-med, right? You can also go to ADA, um, their website, and they have a nice chart too. And you can see if it falls under there as well. Um, because there, you may have patients that are like dialysis or chemo patients that just because of their certain circumstance, they might need a pre-med, which it doesn't fall under your normal umbrella of what you see that needs a pre-med. So consult with physicians about surgeries, medications, overall medical status, and the patient's need for a pre-med um, antibiotic. It just kind of takes some of that stress off of you. So um, valvular heart defects. So what is it? Cardiovascular damage from a malfunctioning heart valve. So we have the mitral valve, there's the aortic valve or the tricuspid valve. Um, mitral valve prolapse is the most common. That's when we used to always give pre med for. We never do that anymore. Um, and then the prolapse is actually when the, um, when the little door, gate, you know, the actual valve kind of flops in backwards um, into the left atrium. And that's that actual prolapsing of the valve. It kind of goes in the wrong way. Stenosis may develop, so backflow of blood from incomplete valve closure, um, and then echocardio um, cardiography or an ultrasound to diagnose. So that's how they would um, look to see what's happening is with, a, with an ultrasound to see what's going on in the heart. So um, risk factors here. So commonly associated with rheumatic fever, if somebody has had rheumatic fever in the past, they may have developed some kind of um, uh, valvular damage due to that. Um, it could be congenital, they were born with it. Um, and then, or it could develop if they've had a history of infective endocarditis. Um, my notes here, I say some patients with valvular heart um, defects, they take anticoagulant medications, depending on the underlying cardiac condition. Uh, I think I talk about that in, in a slide to come though. If the valve cannot be repaired, in most cases, prosthetic valves are available 
um, to replace defective valves. So if the valve, what did I say? That didn't make sense in my head. Most, if the valve cannot be repaired, in most cases, what am I saying? Oh, if they can't repair their natural ones, then they have prosthetic valves. Thank you for explaining myself. <laughs> no, that, no, that makes sense. Now that you say it out loud, that makes sense. So then they would have a, um, a prosthetic, which of course they would get pre-med for that. For individuals with mitral valve prolapse, surgical treatment is not usually necessary unless, um, that's what they used to always call a heart murmur, they have a heart murmur, unless it's um, aimed at alleviating some symptoms that they have, like a palpitation, palpation, palp oh my goodness, palpitations, chest pain, something that they're actually, a symptom that's actually causing some kind of discomfort. Medications are given to control chest pain, slow the heart rate, reduce palpations, and lower anxiety if, if these are some symptoms or manifestations that they're having. Um, let's see. So if you have a patient with a heart defect, but they don't have a prosthesis, um, they just mark it on their medical history, you want to encourage their good oral hygiene, um, their, uh, keeping their um, oral cavity healthy. Um, trying to minimize um, self-induced bacteremias by letting a bunch of inflammation and bacteria um, build up. And then there, you know, we think about this, we always are so worried about manipulating the tissue and causing a bacteremia. But if patients have a lot of inflammation and a lot of plaque and bacteria, then they go in there and do a good job flossing one day. They've just done it to themselves, you know? And so we get kind of worried, but it's like, it happens organically or it happens, you know, patients can do it themselves. So we want to stress the regular maintenance schedules, the good oral hygiene, and the patient who's had a prosthetic valve requires pre-med prior to dental hygiene. So that's one of your biggest red flags there should be that prosthetic valve. So, um, so appointment guidelines. So is patient taking anticoagulant? So are they taking heparin, warfarin, Coumadin, Plavix, something that, you know, um, antiplatelet or a blood thinner? Um, normal, so some things that don't really seem to come to play. They, these are good like national board stuff. They love asking about this, but I've honestly, I, maybe once or twice I've had a patient come in and give me their prothrombin time or their INR. It's really not something you're gonna probably deal with a lot um, because it's more like if the patient's going undergoing some kind of major surgery uh, that the doctor needs to know about their clotting time and, and that sort of thing. But just for your, you will need this knowledge potentially for other reasons. So normal prothrombin time between 11 and 14 seconds is a normal, if, when, if they go in and have it checked before they come to you. But if they're less than 20 the day of their dental hygiene care, then that's okay, you can see that. So less than 20, but 11 to 14 is like considered normal. And then another kind of measurement sort of is this INR. So for laboratory consistency, the international normalization ratio is another, um, as another number for um, clotting factors. And the normal is 1.5 and treatment can be performed between two and three. So it's safe if it's a little higher than normal. Yeah. They could ask about the numbers. Yeah, the national board could ask about the numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prothrombin. And then INR, it's, it's a different kind of test. I don't know if they get both the prothrombin time and the INR, if they get both of those tests. Um, I, they both have to do with clotting, patients' clotting time and their clotting factors. But I don't know if they are going to automatically get both of those or if they just have one of them. But those are the two terms that you would hear, prothrombin time and INR. That's, you know how like when you get it, like if they test your iron and the, this is normal, seven to 11 is normal. So whatever that range is that they're testing. And this is for laboratory consistency, the international normalization. So maybe that's something that 
you know, it, it's a it's a number that can be um, used whether you're here or you're in Spain or whatever. Um, so with with a patient though, so this is some important things for you guys um, to think about for, for regular clinical practice. If you have a patient, but do you remember an oral med, the um, cardiovascular guest that we had, they said they're really not prescribing like warfarin and Coumadin so much anymore. There's a, bit, there's a lot of kind of yucky side effects with those medications. And I've seen lots of patients on warfarin in my career, but I guess he said they're not um, prescribing it as often anymore. Um, so you might not see this as much, but when you have, if you have an SRP and your patient is on some kind of a blood thinner, especially if they are like moderate to severe perio, like they're pretty inflamed and you know there's going to be some good bleeding, um, you want to think about how you're going to approach them. So you scale one, one area at a time, and this is all so you can monitor their bleeding and so things don't kind of get out of hand. So scale one area at a time, begin in the area of least inflammation so that you can see how they're doing. So if you're gonna do half a mouth, pick the half of the mouth that's least inflamed or has the least amount of calculus or whatever so that you can kind of see how they, how they do. If they start just bleeding you know, like crazy, then you, know, you might wanna change something before you get to the other side. Periodically check their clotting time stop um, to see how things, you know, if things stop, um, um, oozing, you know, I've had, and you'll have lots of times when you um, sit your patient up and they're still can spit pink. So I would tell my patients after an SRP, you know, you might spit pink saliva for, you know, the rest of the day or for a couple hours or, you know, usually just a couple hours at the most, but you can tell them that it's, it's not abnormal and rinse with warm salt water and, you know, call if some, if it's bleeding heavier you know, that's obviously going to be a problem, but usually it stops bleeding. It stops um, being in their saliva, you know, very quickly, but that, um, you know, is something you could tell them just so in case it does, so they're not like shocked, like, why am I still bleeding? And then of course, emphasize the good daily hygiene once they're all done so that they can um, um, help minimize that bleeding um, just from the inflammation. So those are good potential test questions. So be sure to that it's you always begin in the area of least inflammation, scale one area at a time. Um, so rheumatic heart disease, what is it? It's a um, cardiac manifestation of rheumatic fever, possible heart damage after somebody has had rheumatic fever. Um, they could have some valvular damage that leads to like a heart murmur, turbulent flow of the blood through the valve was that like that prolapse, it goes in and, and the blood um, goes through the valve and kind of makes that turbulent noise. And that's how they can hear that murmur. Um, rheumatic fever is an acute chronic systemic inflammatory process characterized by attacks of fever, polyarthritis and carditis. The last eventually may result in permanent. So the carditis, obviously inflammation of the heart can result in permanent valvular damage. Um, so somebody could possibly get rheumatic heart disease after they've had strep throat. So that's where um, that comes from. It can develop two to three weeks after their initial infection of strep throat. If they've had a history of rheumatic fever may indicate potentially a valvular defect. Most destructive effects of, is that is the most destructive effect of rheumatic fever is if they have a valvular defect. Damage of valves are susceptible to infection and could possibly lead to infective endocarditis. But here's the caveat, just because someone marks rheumatic uh, fever history on their uh, medical history does not mean you're gonna give them free medication. So, so it's kind of like, oh, you've had rheumatic fever. Do you have a prosthetic valve um, or some other you know, major kind of implant in there? No, okay, then I'm gonna do nothing. That's pretty much what it comes down to. They may have some damage, but um, that doesn't mean that you're going to. Most of the time, pre-med is not gonna be required. It's just gonna be something you note on the chart. Oh, I see you've had rheumatic fever. What came of that? So it's just kind of a conversation that you have with your patient. Yes, yes. If they have a prosthetic valve, then, then, then you give them the pre-med. 
So no pre-med unless valve prosthesis is confirmed. Pre-procedural, you do this with everybody anyways, right? But pre-procedural antimicrobial rinse before tissue manipulation to reduce um, risk or severity of bacteremia. Importance of meticulous interdental cleaning. The patient controls their bacteria in the mouth and they're much less likely to self-induce a bacteremia. Establish good oral hygiene habits to, um, to prevent Pretty much the same thing you would say to all your patients, but we're specifically thinking about that um, risk of bacteremia. Okay, infective endocarditis or IE. Oh, 20 minutes. I think I can do it. Um, okay, so infective, um, it's an infection of the endocardium. Um, the heart valves or cardiac um, prosthesis resulting from a microbial invasion. So we get this sort of like all the, it's like the balance. It's, it's kind of like anything you think of where the, um, the, or the flora gets out of balance. So all this um, bacteria, viruses, um, possibly yeast and fungi, they um, kind of culminate around this, this valve or this prosthetic because it's kind of a weak point in the heart. They culminate around it and then they cause this um, infection. So caused by the bacterium, it gets there through the blood, of course. Staph and strep is mostly what's in it, but there's also yeast, fun, um, fungus, and viruses. So that's why it's called infective, not bacterial endocarditis. Because yes, mostly it probably is bacteria, but there are other things. So that's why they call it an infective, endo, infective endocarditis, not bacterial endocarditis. Right, it can it can happen it can happen in the heart like on a, I mean people have had it for other reasons too, um, but that's the main thing that we're concerned with is the prosthesis. But and it's yeah the last slide it'll it'll talk about the other um, you know heart transplant patients anyone who's had something really major going on with their heart or if they're immunocompromised there's a couple other ones. Um, so risk factors, so if they've had um, previous endocarditis in the past, um, obviously they're going to need to be premedicated because they're already, something about their body, they're predisposed to it, they're susceptible, they had it before, they could have it again, so they're, we're going to want to um, note that, but um, if they're going to have anything that's invasive, so any kind of invasive, and we define that as a procedure that involves manipulating oral soft tissues, manipulation of the periapical area of the tooth more um, or oral mucosa perforation. So anything where blood is expected, you can kind of put it that way. Um, then that's when um, we want to make sure that we're um, being cautious in that respect. Artificial heart valve, serious congenital heart condition, heart transplant with developed valvular problems. So these are just some of those highlights of people that are at risk for infective endocarditis. Identify high-risk individuals through their health history, proper protocol with the antibiotic pre-med, through procedural rinse like we do for everybody to cut down on the bacteria and um, viruses and whatnot, prevent unnecessary trauma to reduce severe. So, you know, sometimes when we're really going to town with our scaling and root planing and the papilla just start flopping away and you know we even though they're good and numb and they got crazy amounts of calculus and we're trying to get it off you still want to try and be as gentle in that area and do the least amount of trauma that you possibly can i'm um, just always being really really cognizant of the the angle of your instrument the toe where's the toe are you in the in the gingiva when you could be wrapped to just try and prevent um, unnecessary trauma Help your client maintain optimal oral health, encourage regular care, all of these things. So this is kind of very, too much, too many words. That's what I love about the student slides. You guys keep it simple and pretty. This is way too many words, but I did want to, I did think that this is very interesting here. Subacute bacterial endocarditis is what I always kind of heard of, you know, subacute back, that was just the phrase I already heard. But that is kind of what's more common in the dental field because it's a slow moving infection with nonspecific clinical features. 
affected um, affects persons usually affected persons usually exhibit a continuous low grade fle fever, marked weakness, fatigue, weight loss, and joint pain. And that is typically what you see as a result of our invasive dental hygiene procedures is the subacute bacterial endocarditis. Now there's also acute bacterial endocarditis. It's a severe infection with a rapid course of action, usually caused by pathogenic microorganisms such as the staph or the strep capable of producing widespread disease. So this one um, is a little bit more intense, acute, happens faster, maybe more, uh, more damage can happen. And they say acute bacterial, I'm still thinking word. I think this is just where the textbook throws different terms in there, but I'm thinking it's probably still under the infective. But anyways, this is not necessarily on uh, an exam. I just think it's interesting to note the difference and how the subacute is the one that we tend to, would net, would possibly induce if it happened on our clock on our watch. Um, let's see, what does this say? As endocarditis progresses, the circulating microorganisms attach to the damaged heart valves or other susceptible areas and proliferate in the colonies. The invasion can result in cardiac failure. So that's the fear with the joints: is oh, is it a weak area? Is bacteria going to culminate there? Um, and there's really no proof that that's true. So that's why we, on our end, on the dental end, we don't feel that that's necessary. So here is the latest summary um, from the ADA. This is the most recent, um, 30 to 60 minutes prior. You can give it after or right when they get there. If your patient shows up and they're like, ah, I forgot to take my pre-med. Um, if your office is the type that keeps clindamycin or amoxicillin on hand, you can give it to them then um, because even up to two hours after an appointment, you can give it to them um, and it still would benefit them greatly. So, um, but up, what's that? I don't think we do, but every office I ever worked for did, but I don't think we do. A lot of... Yeah. Do, oh, would you guys, you dismiss them? Our doctors. Oh, here? Yes. Yeah. If they didn't take your pre-med, you'd have to dismiss them. Yeah. If they, if they came here and they didn't take their pre-med and they didn't have it with them, they'd have to reschedule. Okay. Yeah. I know. Well, yeah, that's probably why we just dismiss them and don't see it. Because if we say, take it right when you get home, and then they don't, then and it's our, mm -hmm, it's ours. So then, yeah, so here we wouldn't see them. But in private practice, I've, every doctor I ever worked for had antibiotic and we would just give it to them. But that's not to say that that's how it'll be where, wherever you start working. So, um, so four main groups, prosthetic, um, cardiac valves or prosthetic material used for cardiac valve repair or other implantable cardiac device such as a transcap um, catheter, I don't know if I'm saying that right, aortic valve implantation. Um, so when it says some other implantable cardiac device such as, that means that tells me there's other things out there. So if it has to do with the valve, just and you're unsure, give a quick call, ask your doctor, your, doc your doctor might feel more confident um, at call the patient's doctor too, just to double check. Um, previous relapse or um, an infective endo history of infective endocarditis recurrent, it says congenital heart disease, cardiac transplant um, recipient, they had a heart transplant. And then here's the two grams of moxicillin, cephalexin two grams, um, azithromycin or um, clarithromycin is 500 and doxycycline is 100. Um, okay. Almost there, nine minutes. Okay. Infective endocarditis continued. Identify high risk individuals via your health history. Ensure the patient took their prescribed antibiotic one hour, 30, 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure. Have the patient use their pre procedural rinse, prevent undue trauma. Is this a repeat? I feel like this is a repeated slide. This is a good point. This you guys need to know. Nine to 14 days between prophylactic antibiotic premedication if multiple appointments. So if you have a scaling and root planning, why do we always say two weeks? 
because we want to see how things heal. But also, if they have to take a pre-med, they're just automatically set up for two weeks anyways, because that's when usually in private practice, I never saw, I always scheduled my scale and replaning two weeks. And people would say, can I come in earlier? And sometimes we'd let them, but usually we didn't. Yeah. I think it has something to do with the, you know, also giving your body kind of a minute to, because, you know, it, it can affect your flora and your gut and all that kind of stuff. So having, you know, you know, although people take antibiotics for a million reasons, but I think that's pretty much um, the reasoning behind that. There's always exceptions in doctors who will say, oh, it's fine, but that's the standard nine to 14 days between. Um, and of course, always pay attention to allergies, patients who are allergic to penicillin. Types of cardiovascular surgery. So again, these are not necessary. I, I don't think any of these are on an exam, but I just think it's kind of interesting to note all the different things that are out there. Angioplasty, most common closed heart surgery, where they'll um, implant a catheter, a long slender tube into the coronary arteries. Um, and then put in a little balloon to open them up, um, to kind of inflate them. Stents uh, placed in conjunction with the angioplasty. It's a mesh-like material placed inside um, to allow for better blood flow bypass. Um, common surgery to replace blocked arteries, valvular defect or replacement. Um, this is your pre-med one here. Heart transplant, end-stage heart disease, difficult to find donors. Obviously you can imagine this would be um, major. Um, consult physician, often they're on an immunosuppressant um, for, a, for a heart transplant. After surgery, often on medications to um, increase healing, suppress immune system, reduce infection, and blood clotting. So they'll be on a lot of medication. Um, And then, oh, here's it. most transplant patients are on long-term preventive antibiotic therapy and controlled systemic bacteremias. Um, so they may be on, on long-term medications, but pretty much any patients with cardiovascular disease, we, we typically see with at least one to two medications long-term anyways. So, um, and then here, oh, oral manifestation. So these are just things that you'll commonly see, there's some overlap. Some of these are just high blood pressure, but um, higher risk for oral disease in general. Um, xerostomia we see with just about every medication out there, but um, uh, that's a high one. Altered taste, gingival enlargement, that's your um, ch calcium channel blockers, or if they're on an immune suppressant, that can also do it. Salivary gland pain, um, exaggerated patient, um, oh, it can, some of these medications um, can exaggerate a patient's current condition. Usually that's with um, the immunosuppressants too. They have something going on. It just, everything seems worse. Everything seems more exaggerated. Um, opportunistic infection, spontaneous oral bleeding, anticoagulants. There's a good table in the book that kind of goes over this, but I think I tried to get it on the slides here. Yeah, I did. So these are some very common drugs that you'll see. So, and then you'll have the brand name, the generic name, the indication for use. So congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and then oral implication. So I just put this on here because I just feel like it's obviously not in exclusive, inclusive. I don't know what word I'm trying to look for, but it's not the only list of medications, but it has some of the most um, common. So we have your glycosides, diuretics, beta blockers, calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitors, vasodilator, angiotensin II receptors, and anticoagulants and antiplatelet medications. So, oh, we're not done. Dual antiplatelet, antiplatelet therapy and angiotensin receptor, the prilocin inhibitors, ARNIs. I don't even remember us talking about ARNIs. Um, but that's just xerostomia. So you can see a lot of um, um, xerostomia, decreased blood clotting, so um, increased bleeding. A lot of them affect bleeding, xerostomia, angiotensin II um, is altered taste, ACE inhibitors, taste 
um, impairment. Nitroglycerin burning of the tongue. Yeah. No, no. Let any lecture guide that's in there is just for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess that does it. I think that's the end of that. So I am going to, there's another PowerPoint um, that's older adults in palliative care. And at some point this week, probably, probably tomorrow because I work from home. So I have a lot of quiet time when Lola's at um, preschool. So tomorrow I will record the um, presentation for that one and I'll upload that onto Moodle. And that one is very intuitive, but there are some really important things, some changes that happen as people age that are very practical for your clinical practice. Um, so it is a re it's re it's a really important one. We don't want to skip it. It's a it's more I say it's more intuitive. Like you could probably read through the PowerPoint and be like, okay, you know, you guys had to do so much self study anyways from last year. So I know you guys are good at that, but um, I definitely want to provide a recording just in case I do a little more explaining or detail. So it shouldn't be too long. It should probably just be maybe a half hour to forty minute long one. So I'll do that tomorrow for you guys and then upload it. Okay, that's it. And then next week we do have a quiz, I think. Am I saying it right? Yep. Um, and then I don't think we have, and two more presentations. So, okay. Yeah, Charity. I'm oh, sorry, were you saying that when we are responding to the that will also be Let me, hold on a second. Let me just look, pull up Moodle real quick here. 